Hi there, I'm Daniel Dwyer. Welcome to The Point. Now, as you know, video games are made up of digital experiences. Experiences like playing sports, driving cars, shooting your friends, and exploring virtual worlds. But these systems are made up of mechanics that play with our sense of challenge and achievement. Now, you can't always see these mechanics, but their power is very real. All right, take this shell game. Underneath one of these cups is a ball. All right, pick one. Now, I could let you know which one it is, but this is actually the best part of the game for you, the player. Right now, you feel empowered. You think that you actually still might win. So what if I kept giving you this feeling over and over again? Or what if I showed you and I let you win at various intervals? You'd probably like that quite a lot. At least that's what behavioral science tells us. And they also tell us that you'd especially like it if we accompany that victory with a lot of flashing lights and celebratory music. Ten years ago, one of the best and most addictive video games ever made was released by Blizzard Entertainment, a game that's had an active player base over 10 million, five high-selling expansion packs, and remains a lucrative cash cow for Blizzard, or rather, Activision Blizzard now. World of Warcraft was a subscription-based game, so they had to convince you to pony up the $9.99 a month with satisfying stuff to do, and that game had a bunch of satisfying stuff to do. A ridiculously large, connected open world, multiple races with multiple classes that could be specced in different ways, hundreds of quests, ways to play, creatures to kill, and places to explore. When the first expansion pack came along, it added two new races, flying mounts, a higher level cap, and an entire new planet with countless quests, cities, dungeons, raids, and enemies to enjoy. This expansion, The Burning Crusade, cost $40 and came out over two years after the original game. By the time Activision's console cash cow, Destiny, has been out for a year and finally pumped full of enough content to warrant its $60 asking price, they would have sold the vast majority of users an additional $80 worth of expansions. So for many, that's a total of $140 for one year of Destiny. And what's brilliant about this is that if you've sunk over 200 hours into Destiny, that probably seems like a pretty great value proposition. Destiny has no monthly fee, it's been designed not to require it. It's a game with a user base famished for new stuff to do. So when there is new content, not only is everyone excited to get access to it, but they're willing to pay for it. Because fuck it, the shooting in this game is actually brilliant. You've got hundreds of hours of entertainment from this game, and all your online buddies are probably gonna buy the content anyway, right? Look, I'm not here to shit on Destiny Player's Serial, believe me. There's no doubt that the game is a quality online co-op shooter. But what does disturb me is that this game has clearly been made to make Activision quite a lot of money, and they're using behavioral science techniques used in casinos to get people hooked as a means of doing so. Which one was it you picked again? The Point, Season 3, Episode 16, Destiny, the Hardcore Gamer Slot Machine. In 2011, a man named John Hobson wrote an article on Gamma Sutra entitled Behavioral Game Design. It's a wonderful read, I encourage you all to take a look at it yourself. In this, he details ways in which players react to ratios and intervals. That's the likelihood of being rewarded with bonuses in a game, the intervals between said rewards, and how finally balancing these can create addictive gameplay. Behavioral science is an important part of many industries, most often used in the super fun fields of advertising, marketing, and the gambling industry. It can be the difference between creating a system that you put down after a few minutes, hours, or days, or weeks, and one you engage with for months or maybe years. Certain reward ratios in games are set. We all know if you collect 100 coins, Mario gets a new life. We know unlocking the best gear in Call of Duty comes after X amount of kills with the shitty guns. Some of these rewards ratios work and others don't. Titanfall is a good example of how it might not. There's no doubt it was a great game, but the player base dropped off really soon after the first month because there was never that chase to unlock better gear. Most of the good stuff was easily attainable. And all the extra DLC levels in the world can't help a game if players feel like they've nothing to grind towards. But what if the player never knew when the next unlock was coming? What effect would that have? John explains it best when he references B.F. Skinner's operant conditioning experiments in which they managed to replicate the behaviors of humans using slot machines in a casino with pigeons looking for food, not just by giving them rewards, but by varying when the rewards are given. The main thing is what, what we call schedules of reinforcement. Reinforcement is what the layman calls reward, and you can schedule it uh, so that a reward occurs every now and then when a pigeon does something. We usually use a response with a pigeon pecking a little disc, a little spot in the wall, and you can reinforce with food. But 
you don't reinforce every time, you're every, perhaps every tenth time, or perhaps only once every minute or something like that. There are a very large number of, of schedules. One of, the, one of the schedules, which is very effective with, with rats or pigeons, is what we call the variable ratio schedule, and that is at the heart of all gambling devices and has the same effect. People gamble because of the schedule of the reinforcement that follows. And this is true of all gambling systems. They all have variable ratios built into them. So what we've learned from the pigeon, it made it possible to interpret this vast field very effectively. Like Diablo or Raiding in WoW, variable ratios are core to Destiny's addictive quality. If the player doesn't know exactly when the reward is coming, then it could arrive at any time. I can't remember many moments from my time playing World of Warcraft, but I still remember the day I got an epic drop from a random raptor in Stranglethorn Vale. Every time I killed a random mob after that, a little part of me wondered if I might get another epic. It was like scratching a lottery ticket or pulling a one-armed bandit. That's because the variable ratio schedule is the same technique used on millions of computerized slot machines around the world. And the more of these mechanisms you have working at any one time, the less chance there is for the player to get bored in those intervals. In Destiny, you're always looking for that next big drop. Sometimes it's at a fixed ratio that you could aim for, like say, a weapon from a boss or something you can buy with glimmer you've grinded for. Sometimes it's variable, a random drop from an enemy. And then there are marks, vanguard and crucible marks that you get from strikes or the PvP stuff. But you only get a hundred of these a week, so you kind of have to come back and grind for those at a different time. And then there's the rep with the various factions who won't sell you stuff unless you're cool with them. Oh, and don't worry, if any of that stuff isn't working out right now, you're probably grinding your character level at the same time too. It's an ever-shifting, morphing system where old units of exchange become redundant and content updates bring new currencies, new ways to win, new ratios with overlapping intervals, so you're always stuck in some sort of feedback loop. You're always achieving. Oh, sorry, you're getting bored. No, 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 don't get bored. Here's an engram. Take it to a vendor. He'll unlock it for you. That's called delayed gratification. In fact, Scientific American Mind just published an article about delayed gratification this month in which they explained how it increases the value of an anticipated reward regardless of its actual contents. So your brain will really enjoy the dopamine hit this little thing gives you even when you bring it to the vendor and it ends up being another piece of shit green rocket launcher. It's a game full of these tiny little tricks to please your brain. That's why it's so restrictive. That's why they don't allow you to trade items. If they allowed that, you'd avoid too many of the little pleasing brain tricks they've stuck in there. Remember our friend John? He spent years working at Microsoft on games like Halo 2 and Age of Empires 3. His role was to conduct research into this player satisfaction, proposing gameplay ideas that would eventually lead to higher player satisfaction and an increase in total playing time. While I brought up his expertise for a reason, it turns out John now works for Bungie as lead of both their customer relationship management and user research teams. This is a team of researchers who provide our designers with feedback from real gamers and then help them use that feedback to inform better design decisions, which includes a wide variety of research activities ranging from small scale lab studies to betas and analytics for millions of players. Now I can hear the appeals already. Yes, all games have mechanics to keep you hooked. They want you to keep playing, to keep being entertained, at least, usually, until the story culminates. Designers want to keep you engaged, entertained, but most games have the content to keep this loop going until its eventual end. Destiny doesn't, and I'm beginning to think it's by design. Destiny is a content pipeline which has been made with the goal of creating users hungry for new content. All the new content comes in the form of paid expansion packs, and there are lots of them. With other games, season passes and DLC content appeals to players who want to play more, more maps, more modes, more skins. And over the past few years, we've seen more developers and publishers take more out of their games in order to sell them to us later. Destiny has taken this to a whole new level in that their DLC, their season pass, is content practically every player of the game wants. We all raise our pitchforks at the idea of optional content, but the content packs in Destiny aren't really optional. They are essential to it being a game worth playing. Remember, this is Activision's 10-year project, a $500 million investment which their shareholders will respect the return on. This is a game with millions of registered players that in the first year sold three expansion sets that will have netted them $140 from most of their customers. This is why I take exception with Destiny. I'm not saying it's a bad game, I'm saying it's a manipulative one. I mean, it's Farmville for shooters.
computer fans, just instead of farming the land, you're farming XP, loot, and whatever fake new currency the game creates to keep you inside another masterfully crafted ratio scheduling system. Look, I don't like shitting on games for the sake of it. Destiny is a good game, maybe it's a great game. A lot of people here at GameSpot love it. In fact, there's probably a bunch of people upstairs playing it right now. But what I am doing is highlighting what I genuinely believe are distasteful game design practices. This game has managed to sell a lot of DLC on the back of using techniques that we've learned from lab pigeons and people using one-armed bandits in casinos. And if that doesn't make me feel uncomfortable, certainly as somebody involved in the games press, then I don't know what really can. Destiny is a game that has been crafted to get people coming back. If you want to play for an hour, there's something to do. If you want to play for the whole weekend, there's something to do. Don't worry, their user research team has you covered with a variety of ways to keep you happy. Hey, people are free to do whatever they want to entertain themselves. Games are a release, they're entertainment, and sure, on the face of it, $100, maybe over the course of a year, let's say 10 bucks a month, if you play this game a lot, it's probably a good return on investment. But when these sorts of behavioral practices are being used to encourage people people into spending hard-earned cash on content that they rightfully should have gotten in the game at release, or at the very least free as an apology, I can't agree that that's okay. I don't want this to work. I have nothing against Bungie or Activision, but there's enough of this skeezy psychological game design bullshit happening in the world of Facebook games and mobile games without it being dragged into our playpen. If this is the future of AAA development, then I worry for the future of AAA development. In any case, I'm choosing not to indulge this type of game design practices, and that really is of my own free will. Oh, and as for the shell game, well, actually, this was a con job used by street artists to swindle people out of their hard-earned cash, but, you know, as you paid all the DLC, and I probably want to keep you as a happy customer. Congratulations! You win! Woo! Let's play again! Where does that leave free will? Because we all think we have a choice whether to do things or not to do things. Yes. Well, you see, we assume somehow or other that these internal states, feelings, and so on, have initiated something. They have started something. They have created. We, 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 we have done something in, in a voluntary way. We have willed to act. If you now look at the actual history, we find that there are external reasons why this has happened. In other words, by discovering the causes of behavior, we, we can dispose of the imagined internal cause. We dispose of free will as a, an American divine of the 18th century, Jonathan Edwards did. He said, we believe in free will because we know about our behavior, but not about its causes. And of course, it's, a, it's, it's the, the object of the science of behavior to discover causes. And once you have found those causes, there is less you need to attribute to an internal act of will, and eventually, I think, we need to attribute nothing to it.